friction tends to be mostly with those outside factors. The parents, especially if they're very hands-on and if what they're contributing is a large portion and they just want to make sure that it's going to the right places and being used wisely. I feel like there have been many times where I've kind of had to step outside of my role as a planner and step in as like a moderator. And you do it with love and you do it with all the experience in the world and you just say, you know, it's going to be this, that and the other thing. But that can tend to be the number one thing. I'm Kadeem Layla. I'm Bethan Moorcraft. And this is a Half-Banked Podcast presented by Money.ca. You swiped right on someone, you clicked, you fell in love. Maybe you moved in and got a pet together. You've decided you want to merge your lives and your finances for better or for worse. For a lot of couples, there may be daydreams of walking down the aisle, dressed in your best, heartfelt wedding vows, and families coming together in celebration. But like a lot of things in life, the price tag can put a damper on those visions. In Canada, the average wedding costs about $29,000, according to WeddingWire.ca, and 30% of couples admit to taking on debt to cover the costs of the big day. That could be why couples are getting married later in life, with the latest statistics showing that many Canadians are now waiting until their early or mid-30s to tie the knot. One major factor in this trend is that more couples are moving in together and living together longer before marriage. Since 1981, the percentage of common law couples in Canada has increased from 6% to over 20%. It's important to agree on a financial plan before you take that next big step as a couple. If the cost of your big day pushes your finances beyond the brink, then your honeymoon period could be short-lived. Now, it's not just the happy couples splashing the cash during wedding season. The financial burden also weighs on guests especially if you're planning to attend multiple celebrations in one year. Gifts, hotels, maybe flights, maybe a new suit or dress, all these add up quickly. But backing out of a wedding for financial reasons might make you feel like you're letting a friend or relative down. In this episode of Half Banked, we'll talk to a wedding planner, my wedding planner to be exact, to examine some do's and don'ts for budgeting for your big day. We'll also talk to a millennial Torontonian who's been part of so many weddings she decided to make a business out of it. And she's here to dish on how young Canadians can survive the summer wedding season. Now we have Amanda Cowley, founder, head planner and designer of Amanda Cowley Events, based in Niagara, Ontario. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I think this will be a very uh, interesting look and uh, kind of an inside look at the wedding industry. So really appreciate it. And so um, I just want to ask if you're comfortable just talking about your background a little bit, how you got into this, how long you've been at it. Yeah, actually, this August, just in a few short weeks, not far off from your wedding weekend, actually, will be my 10th anniversary doing this. I am a floral designer by trade. I've been a cake designer and maker. I've worked in wineries. I've assisted photographers. So I've had my hand in weddings and events since I've started working at maybe 16 years old. I think you're great. So well, that's nice. just throw, throw, throw a little compliment in there. <laughs> and then also, I guess the uh, people you work with can be entertaining kind of for better or for worse too. So, so we'll get into that as well. Um, so what would you say is like the average price people end up paying for the weddings for the people that you work with? Well, it's so different from where we were pre-pandemic, which is only just a handful of years ago. But where we were even 10 years ago feels like a lifetime ago. Like it is just absolutely silly to think that 10 years ago, what you could have for a average size wedding, 100 to 150 people is kind of an average size wedding today, getting closer to that 100 mark, scaling back and definitely making things more intimate is the trend I see. You were looking at spending around the $40,000 mark in the beginning of things to host about 150 50 people, a really lovely wedding with delicious food and entertainment and kind of the bells and whistles. And it would be beautiful and memorable. Today to accomplish something like that definitely approaches the 70 to 80 and up mark. How much do you think that kind of the economic factor of inflation is playing into that too? Just kind of generally raising the price of everything. The vendors that I refer or even a lot of the venues, especially being Niagara based, I work with a lot of family run wineries or I work with people who want to celebrate on their private properties. And so we're working with a lot of vendors that are small business owners. And so the cost of what they 
pay to staff that they're training and clinging onto for dear life, fuel costs, supply costs, supply chain issues, all of those things definitely impact the pricing I've seen and the quotes I've received even just over the last few years, for sure. Yeah, grocery shopping is night and day compared to what it was a few years ago, and that's transferable right across the wedding board, for sure. Absolutely. One thing we're interested in as well, um, in researching for this episode and looking at weddings and costs, etc., we found that people are generally kind of getting married a bit older these days in the kind of mid, early to mid 30s range. So that might include kind of professional couples who have built up some savings and they're willing to kind of do this themselves. Do you see differences in spend between sort of different generations? Yeah, so I'm definitely working with a lot of professional people and that affects a budget massively. And it's for the reasons that you say. Um, A lot of times they're in their mid to late 30s and older. They have some savings behind them. They know what they want. Their point of view is really, really clear. And so to plan with someone who has a really clear point of view, it's easy to sort of say, these are the non-negotiables. It's going to be A, B, and C. We don't care about the fluff. We're not interested in being influenced by anything from the outside. Pinterest is a thing, whatever. That's not our thing. It's like we care about a gorgeous venue, delicious food, a premium bar, and some great entertainment. Mm -hmm. And we're going to throw the whole budget at those things. And if it gets a little bit out of hand, that's okay because we've got that buffer. But when it's like a 20 year old couple, and I still do work with young couples, which is really nice. Priorities are definitely different. And then the decisions made based on those things have many moving parts because they're supported by things like family or having to take out some form of loan or assistance in order to cover the costs of the wedding. How big of a role do you feel that social media and everything we see on the internet kind of has to play in that, you know, I want to have the biggest, most sparkly, best wedding of 2023. Yeah, I hear it often from my brides specifically, um, although I have lots of grooms who care very much, but my brides are the ones that are being sort of like inundated by, you know, you can't, if you search one hashtag on Instagram or you look up one thing on Pinterest, it is just going to come at you so quick and fast and it's changing every single minute. And so to even keep up with what is the coolest thing anymore and is this thing that I really liked worth investing in because I'm planning my wedding a year and a half in advance. So I've fallen in love with this thing that's going to take up a good little chunk of my budget, but I'm worried about even like, is that going to be relevant or I'm going to like it still when I get married? You're making decisions that are so far in advance that you're hoping they're wise investments. So I would say my role there is to always sort of go back to what's classic, go back to what stands the test of time, what you're going to look in your photos 20 years from now, and you're going to say, I am so glad that we went for that really classic thing and that maybe we didn't do, I don't know, like some wild, trendy thing that somebody made everybody think was the great thing to do. Taking inspiration and maybe adding a little bit, infusing a little bit, but not feeling like you need to do every single trendy thing that's out there because it's unlimited. It's infinite. I was going to say, uh, Monica actually had, you know, some Pinterest boards, but I think in her case, it was not, let me look online and see what's trendy. It was like, I kind of like this. I want to see, get some ideas based around what I already like. Yeah. Um, and that- the flower umbrellas, you know, that was something she got from there, but I think she had that idea beforehand. So it's not just social media kind of dictating what she wants. It's just like you can find some inspiration and still kind of make it timeless and make it more customized. Yeah, you guys are the perfect example of having a wedding that is truly who you guys are as a couple. I mean, we're infusing two very bold cult- cultures. We're we're pulling on the food, we're pulling on the drinks, we're pulling on the color, we're pulling on the music, we're pulling on so many things that are true to who you are in the fusion of your families. But then, like you said, we can't help but think that this like little pineapple <laughs> thing we saw to do for a signature cocktail is so cute. So we're going to do it. But again, it's relatable and it's not like a budget breaker. We're not going to break the budget doing that. Um, yeah, that's like the perf- you guys are the perfect example of that for sure. 
Oh, sure. I was hoping you were going to dish the dirt yeah. off the demon and give us a green filler. No way. No way. No. Uh, they were going to edit that sentence, just say a perfect example, like for yeah. a couple, just get it like shortened. And yeah, I think we'll, we'll let it run like that. Um, so, <laughs> and then yeah, even the, even the rum and pineapple thing is also just, um, that's something that I actually, you know, like to drink. So it's something, something we want to like factor in that way, make it more customized and personal again. Yeah. Thank you. And so I'm, I'm excited to learn that that's, uh, we were going about it the good way. It's good to hear that. <laughs> so, and then I was also wondering, um, you know, there's a lot of things kind of surprising for me when it came to costs of weddings. I think uh, one of the ones I've sort of, I think I've touched on a little bit here is just the, the venue cost, how that doesn't include like everything. I kind of assume it comes like, you know, already that includes all food, all drinks, table settings and so forth. It doesn't. And then I'm wondering for other, you know, a lot of the couples you work with, like what do they view or what tends to come up as like kind of the most surprising cost? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I think that a lot of times the photo and video costs, if that's something that couples are going after, can kind of make them take a step back and think, oh, wow. And I kind of prep them before we even start reaching out to vendors. You know, we're not going to waste anyone's time and just cold call. You know, I, I have like a little running list of the vendors that I love working with that I can give great feedback on because of personal experience time and time again. So I try to make referrals for clients based on those kinds of things, not only the style that they have and what they're looking for aesthetically, but where their budget realistically is to hire something like that. And then florals have become one of those components and you're shaking your head because you looked at a floral quote. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and again, a few years ago, floral quotes look a lot different than they do today. But the pandemic shook everything up. So I'm just going to, well, if I get married, make everyone pick some flowers and <laughs> carry them in. <laughs> Bring a daisy. It'll be fine. Yeah. Dandelion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Amanda, at the start of this uh, chat, you said that, you know, today you could be spending in the range of $70,000 for a average sized, you know, 100, 150 guest wedding, which is a big sum of money. How often do you see just wedding spending generally getting out of control? Obviously, as a planner, you can help people to kind of see, look at their budget and, you know, think about that. But how often do you see it, hear about it? And what can be done? My job with full service more than anything is to make sure that that budget stays on track, and that there isn't that out of control feeling. Inevitably, it is going to be something that has to be considered. Like there's always got to be a buffer built in there. But I do find that when I see things get out of hand, it is almost generally not in the bride and groom's control. Mm. It is about things like family members saying, we need to have 12 more people come or 20 more people come, or we forgot about this number of people, or now we want to provi provide transportation services and move all of the guests. And we'd like to cover that cost. We don't want guests covering that cost. Or we want to upgrade from the standard bar package to the premium bar package. We'd like to see a premium bar offered. Whether that's that fund is being contributed by the parent making the request or the family member making the request or the bride and groom. It's still the budget at the end of the day. It's still all a part of the same spreadsheet. And so that is where I usually see things go outside of the original scope and the original plan. It's those outside factors. And it's really hard as a couple, especially if they are being gifted a portion of the budget by parents, grandparents, whoever it is, to say no to things like that. It's very difficult. I was wondering then, so do you typically try to give um, or, you know, have them plan for a range outside of their budget? Or basically when you're doing the budget initially, are you kind of like planning for, you know, 5,000 over or whatever? Yeah, I would say that's fair. Or when we see that outside factor come in, then we kind of look and see, okay, where can we pull back a little bit? Or where can we be more hands on? And again, to go back to you guys, Kadeem and Annika, like, Monica and I just went through all of the plans for stationery, which she's designed all of the stationery on her own. She's designed all the signage on her own. She's having it printed through a very reasonable printer. And rather than paying, you know, a stationery and signage designer to do that for far more than what you guys are going to invest into that portion of your day, she's taken it on. She's taken that sort of like hands on. Yes, she likes doing it. She's so type A and loves the control. I'm sure it's going to be exactly what she wants. And I appreciate that so much. But like 
Also, what a great way to not have every single category of your budget just blown to the very top. Let's be reasonable in some areas and get hands on. And that's that was one of the ways. And I, I think that's always a great way. Something that feels hands on. You can't photograph your wedding day. You know, you can't maybe do all the florals. You can't cater it or bartend it, but you can do some other things. And that's a great way to adjust if you need to. That's what we were thinking with the, the small things, because like the logo, especially, because I just want to give credit to one of, my, one of our friends. Like she actually reached out about designing it because we knew she did graphic design. We were looking at other places, you know, charging a lot more, like you mentioned. Yeah. Our friend was willing to just like kind of give us that as a wedding gift. So again, a hands-on piece kind of helps save some money. Yeah. And then I guess I wonder, uh, do you have like specific areas where you find the friction pops up the most when it comes to couples when they're planning their budget? Yeah, the friction, again, tends to be mostly with those outside factors. The parents, especially if they're very hands-on and if what they're contributing is a large portion and they just want to make sure that it's going to the right places and being used wisely. I, I feel like there have been many times where I've kind of had to step outside of my role as a planner and step in like a moderator. Yeah. You must have had instances where one of the two is somewhat dragged to you <laughs> Uh, you know, we're going to use a wedding planner to plan the wedding, etc. Um, and maybe there are couples as well who perhaps aren't on the same page when it comes to expenses and what they want to spend on the big day. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have for, for those couples who perhaps aren't quite yet on the same page? Like, I feel like going back to the non-negotiables, I think... When you sit down and start planning a wedding, whether you're doing this with your planner, if you're going to hire one or you're doing this on your own, I think that making a list of sort of the non-negotiables and each having one is such a great thing to come back to when it feels like you're getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. So when I got married, for me, I knew I wanted to get married in June because that's when peonies are in bloom and they're my favorite flower. And I couldn't imagine not having peonies at my wedding. I know that seems ridiculous, but that was my non-negotiable. My husband's was to have a band, a live band, non-negotiable. And I knew that if I got married outside of June, then A, peonies weren't going to be in season. And if they were imported from another country, then they were going to be three to four times more per stem than I was paying in season locally. So that was a non-negotiable for me. And I knew what his was. And then the exterior items, we kind of just had to always find a middle ground. But we always came back to the things that we knew were the most important. We got married when we were quite young. So we did have, you know, those external considerations when it came to parents gifting and being a part of our budget. And I feel like that pressure we received being my mom is Italian. And so, you know, her to hear I was marrying a munji cake and having a 120 person wedding was kind of shocking and almost not believable. So she tried to help make that guest count grow. And a cheeky thing we did is secured a venue that really could only accommodate 120 people. So that's a very cheeky little tip. And I think that this might be something that you guys have done because you probably could have had a thousand person wedding realistically, (laughs) but your venue can't accommodate much more comfortably than 120. So if you can kind of use the venue as your leverage there, that's a great way to sort of help manage your day and not let it get out of hand. It physically can't. Because I will say, too, uh, even um, that actually ends up being one of the tough things when it comes to the planning piece is actually just fitting as much as you want in the 120. Like outside the financials, that's one piece that kind of uh, ties in that makes uh, weddings more difficult. Just a heads up for some people. That's an important point, though, because people just might not even know where to start. If you know they're engaged, they want to get married, don't know where to start. So they'll look to a planner. But there's also a cost that comes with bringing in an expert to help with that. It's a long journey for most. Um, The longest client I've had, she booked me two years before COVID and we planned together for four and a half years. (laughs) <laughs> wow. Your your face is so great. Yeah, but, you know, we replanned her wedding four times. Yes. Most of the time, they're, they're reaching out to me anywhere from a year and a half to two years in advance. So it is, a, it is a long relationship. With that comes a lot of time and a lot of energy. The range for a planner, depending on the level of service they're going to provide to the client, I would say can be anywhere from the $3,000 to $10,000 range. The stat you see over and over again when looking, you know, you get engaged and you go online and what does a wedding budget look like? And it's a pie. Mm -hmm. It's normally 10% that goes to the planner of your overall budget. Okay. So if you're planning a $100,000 wedding, 
you can probably expect that your planner is going to charge about $10,000 to plan that wedding. All right, thank you. And I guess I was wondering too, because a uh, part of the wedding cost that we want to touch on is also looking at, you know, guests, uh, wedding party, groomsmen and so forth. Do you have kind of uh, tips or stories related to kind of managing that piece of things in order to, um, as part of the budget? I would say that when couples feel the obligation or the want, even just the want to have a wedding party, um, especially a larger one, with that comes this like guilt about how much each of those individuals is paying to participate in their wedding day. Right. And you're, you're both nodding your head because we've both, <laughs> we've both, we've all been there where we've been like, okay, we're going to do the, you know, we're going to do the bridal shower. We're going to do the bachelorette. We're going to do the, okay, now it's the wedding. We're going to stay in a hotel, hair and makeup, dress. Like it is a lot of moving parts. And for couples who can put it in their budget to do something to help offset some of those costs, it's so nice when like maybe your hair and makeup is a gift that's a part of the wedding day to your bridesmaids or the shirts that the guys are going to wear, cufflinks or something. I mean, just like little details like that to help try to offset some of those costs is really nice. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, learning learning more and also getting some compliments from you, which I appreciate. Uh, so uh, <laughs> for Bethy, uh, yet, but you know, maybe uh, you two will meet again in the future. Oh, we never know. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> that would be lovely. We can have a wildflower wedding. I love that. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> I think she's nodding her head. I think she's down. So yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. I uh, appreciate it. And I think uh, listeners will get a lot of value out of that. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This was really nice. Thank you. So I was wondering if someone who's uh, you said you'd be looking to get married at some point in the future, what, uh, what's the first thing on your mind after that discussion? Well, I have to say the first thing on my mind was that she said you were the perfect couple. <laughs> <laughs> I said no other context, just perfect couple. That's yeah. all she said. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, perfect co-host, perfect couple. Oh, thank you. Well, um, no, but uh, yeah, I was, well, I was quite shocked by the two items she flagged as being the surprise cost. Um, that being flowers or florals and photography. Um, as I as I kind of joked, uh, you know, get everyone to pick some flowers. Yeah. I just didn't. I didn't even think about why that would be such an expense. I mean, have, have you noticed that in planning? Like, I guess photography video didn't surprise me as much. And uh, we worked with a photographer before. And I just uh, one thing that kind of matters when you're sort of a person of color is a photographer who actually gets your color right. Lighting turns out well. You actually like look at good in pictures. So, you know, that was something that we kind of did not want to compromise on. Mm-hmm. And then video, it, it is nice to have after, depending on if you can swing it. And But yeah, I think floral was just more shocking in terms of the, you know, what it adds versus how much it costs. So I think that that really took me out. The other thing that I thought was really important actually was when uh, she was talking about kind of reducing costs for the wedding party and for guests. Um, I went to three weddings last summer, so we're well and truly in, you know, the wedding stretch of life. Yeah. Yeah. And um, all three, actually, the bridesmaids, they followed a color pattern, but they were allowed to go and get whatever dress, like she said, whatever dress they were comfortable in. Mm. And uh, they looked fab. And I think that's important if you feel good, the colors were there for the photos, et cetera. But uh, I think that sort of compromise is really important. And it's more about kind of bringing your friends and family together. It doesn't need to be uniform perfection, in in my opinion, but obviously, you know. No, for sure. Because uh, even getting some of the groomsmen suits for one of my friend's weddings, and even then it wasn't um, like, you know, sweetheart table instead of a big groom's table. I think that's kind of one of the things, but we are all dressed up the same, but we didn't have to go basically to the same tailor and get the same black suit. It's kind of like get a black suit, you know, this style, like two pockets, whatever, and then kind of go wherever where's closest for you since everyone's out of town. So they don't have to spend time and money traveling to one spot to meet up, get the same suit at the same place. And some of them are able to get their suits for, you know, much cheaper than others and like whatever works best for them. Yeah. It's at the end of the day, it's just, we look kind of close enough. We don't have to be identical and perfect for the pictures and the pictures still turned out great anyway. I just think that's important, especially when you might be going to one, two, three weddings a year and buying something new, a new outfit for each wedding just kind of seems um, expensive, expensive, yeah. a bit silly maybe. And and that's something that we're going to really take a deep dive into with our next guest. Uh, and with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Jay Simpson, a senior underwriter for a Toronto insurance company and the owner of Jay's Boutique, a custom craft shop for events like weddings, birthdays and other milestones. Jay, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. And yeah, thanks for joining us. 
So I guess we'll get into it. Uh, first thing I've heard, you've attended a lot of weddings. Just wonder if you can uh, verify a number for me. So in the last five years, I've attended six weddings. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then we understand that helped you to start your business, uh, Jay's Boutique. But good first, can you talk us through the expenses that basically go into attending and or participating in a wedding? I think this is a really important topic to discuss because I think a lot, especially as somebody who's part of the wedding party, you tend to get really excited. You want to stand there. You want to support your friends, you know, all of the fun things that come with having a wedding and being there. But I think a lot of people get caught up in those moments and they really don't understand that there is a large financial aspect to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just being a guest alone, you know, a lot of us want to buy a new dress, new shoes, you know, outfit like that. Right. Wedding gifts, you know, if you're attending any of the pre-wedding celebrations, there's always a financial cost to the excitement, unfortunately. So, I mean, for me, a lot of the weddings that I've been in have been really close friends to me. So I've been lucky enough to have brides in my life where they've asked in advance. The general rule of thumb is six months prior to the wedding. But I think just life gets busy and things like that and people want to go, 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 um, you know, so I've been lucky to have that advance notice. So that's really helped for budgeting those kind of things. Oh, for sure. It's funny what you said about, you know, you want to have a new dress or a new pair of shoes. I really feel like, and Kadeem, you can correct me if uh, if you disagree, but I feel like it's, it's kind of a woman issue because maybe <laughs> I'll recycle a pair of heels, but I don't want to wear the same dress with it if I'm at two or three weddings in, in this summer. So it does like it, it adds up definitely i will say for me as a, as a guy too though like if you're attending weddings where there's a kind of mutual friends between them like i had a one friend's wedding last summer and i know i didn't want to wear the same suit to another friend's this summer because like a lot of the a decent amount of the cr uh, crowd overlaps so i definitely did want to be viewed in the same in the same suit as i was last time because also looking back at pictures maybe they notice like even if they don't remember oh their same suit as like, you know mm -hmm. cooper's wedding this one i'm like yeah i don't, don't want to do that either i'm not gonna lie it does feel nice to kind of get a new suit kind of the excitement of putting that on maybe you know I, I have some of that excitement when it when it comes to weddings as well oh yeah for sure I, that's one of my favorite parts the whole like dress up part <laughs> also extra context for our listeners Kadeem is a very uh sharply dressed fella oh, so thank you, thank you. Uh, he, he has <laughs> lots of suits <laughs> so Jay you know when budgeting for those expenses have you had to make certain compromises um and can you share any kind of strategies uh that you've you've used to kind of get through that yeah, actually, um, I have a very good example. Um, when I was a lot younger, you know, I had got my first apartment moving out of my parents' house. And one of my um, friends that I had grown up with, uh, she was getting married and it was a destination wedding. So I was like, awesome, I'm in. Like, yes, I want to be there. We did the whole like dress thing and everything like that. And then when it came down to it, again, she was a bride that was planning ahead. I think she had like a two year plan for it. Once it came to booking where she was going to have the wedding, what resort we were going to be staying at, it was extremely unaffordable for me. That was one of the first weddings I was in. And I will admit it was a big learning experience from there because, again, I was caught up in the excitement. It's a vacation. It's a wedding, too. It's going to be such a blast. And then I guess I didn't really have grip on how expensive some of these things could be, especially, you know, weddings are family. So you're going to a family resort. You're not going to a resort where, you know, everyone's partying 24 hours a day. So sometimes the costs are more because there's water parks, whatever. So that was a huge learning lesson very early on in my participation in weddings. But I mean, there's absolutely, you know, budget cuts that do happen. Maybe I won't be going out as often. Um, you know, I won't be splurging on regular shopping as often, you know, so there are those little things there. But I do believe, too, that it's hard to budget if you're not already financially responsible or budget savvy. And I think that's a really key lesson, you know, especially being the generation that we are. I think we lacked a little bit of that education. Um, you know, I'm happy that schools are teaching it now, but I wouldn't say that, you know, our parents were just working to pay the bills. So maybe they didn't have that budget sense either. So I think that's a big struggle for our generation. And we've definitely touched on that in previous episodes of the podcast too, never really getting kind of formal teaching. It's kind of like, you know, you, you know, go into the frying pan and kind of learn um how you know how to make it work as you go along so it's definitely like learning a lot of things the hard way and i guess that point you touched on about the notice i believe like that helps with budgeting because you mentioned you know six months out i'm guessing if you know you have a big wedding coming up especially if it's destination or anything like that maybe you you know you're probably not going out as much leading up to that maybe not buying um outside of the clothes for the wedding maybe you don't buy as much new stuff 
during that either. So I'm guessing that that's kind of a piece of the budgeting. Yeah, that's where it is. You know, I mean, let's face it, it's expensive to live these days. So a lot of us don't have just that large fund money where we can just dip into for all those things. So I I do believe that you kind of have to think about it. You know, going into this wedding, there are going to be sacrifices that I have to make. And I mean, especially being in the party, you're kind of responsible for things. You know, on the women's side, some people do the bridal shower and the bachelorette. The guys have their bachelors, you know, there's things like that. Jack and Jill's, if that's a factor, if they're trying to raise money. So there's a lot of support that's needed. And I think people need to understand that they're not just asking you to be in the nice picture. They're asking you to help support them through this because weddings are expensive. Do you think it would ever reach a point where you would have to or be willing to say no? You know, I'm sorry, I can't come to that destination wedding because flights hotels etc are too expensive and like would you be comfortable to say that I think it's a hard thing to say I mean obviously you feel super special that that person's even making that decision for you Mm -hmm. but I'm also a firm believer in communication and if you and this person have this relationship you know keep it open and honest with them even when you're close with friends you don't really know what they have going on in the background I mean at the end of the day relationships are, are communication And if you have that open communication with somebody, it just makes things so much easier. Can you talk us through like bachelorette parties or things like that for friends? Can you talk us through some of the costs of organizing those events? Let's just talk bachelorette, for example. So what what do they see for their bachelor bachelorette parties? Is it um, something where they want to go away? Mm -hmm. That's another huge financial aspect to it. Um, You know, is it something they just want to do a one day thing or is it going to be like a weekend of events? I think once you get a better idea and understanding of that, and again, it is honesty, you know, I have $200 I can pitch on The Bachelorette. As soon as you know exactly what that number is, let that maid of honor know or the uh, best man know, you know, this is what my budget is. And sometimes people have different incomes, people have different lifestyles. So yeah, you can only pitch 200, but maybe there's somebody else that can afford a little bit more. So it doesn't mean that you're not, you know, still helping out with that. Mm -hmm. Just really boils down to just be loud about it and, you know, be honest with people and nobody should be shaming you. At the end of the day, everybody knows the financial cost, the cost of living right now. So there, I think in today's day, there's a lot more understanding around that than, you know, maybe 10 years ago when things were a lot less costly. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm really getting this kind of, uh, you know, what you're saying about open communication, being honest with each other about what you can afford and, you know, what you can be part of. I think the issue today is that there seems to be kind of heightened expectations on people about, you know, what they do for their bachelorette, bachelor parties, having a destination wedding, doing all of these big things and getting the best possible social media posts and stuff like that. You know, what what do you think is behind those expectations, not just for weddings, but also in other kind of major life milestones and events? Yeah, we're very much, I don't know if this is going to age me, but doing it for the gram is still a thing. (laughs) You know, people want the likes, the follows, they want to be talked about and, you know, shared on a stranger's page and, you know, all that feedback. Let's be honest, family is a huge factor. Oh, yeah. Especially if you're the only child getting married or... Oldest. The oldest, the baby, you know, there's a lot of family pressures. And even culturally, I think there's a lot of influence, um, you know, being in Canada, we're a multicultural country, so everybody's coming from back home. So you want to make sure that you keep that authenticity to your culture there as well, while still pleasing and, and making sure that it's you. Birthdays seem to be going that way now, too. I find a lot of more people are like renting halls and having this big balloons everywhere and the fancy lights and the DJs and the photo booths. And, you know, so I mean, what's the difference between a wedding and a birthday when it comes to having all those things there? There's pressures there, too. You know, your friend's having this big, gigantic birthday and it's like well they're inviting me they're spending all of this money you know I want to get them the best gift so then that kind of pressure kicks in too so we kind of get it from all angles I definitely think social media is like the main driver in all of that (laughs) yeah well absolutely well I was just gonna say I'm not married one day I would like to be but uh that scares me just the idea of splashing out so much cash on one you know eight to ten hours of fun (laughs) Um, it kind of like uh, that's kind of scary. I feel a lot of pressure um, from the brides and grooms that I've kind of been on that journey with is, you know, the family pressure, you know, inviting your third cousin twice removed that you've never met before in your life. And and that's a cost to the bride and groom. And that that's when the guest list blows out of the water. There is that pressure to have certain people invited. 
And then you're kind of thinking about that. I mean, one article I'd read uh, kind of just put into perspective. It's like, would you pay, you know, for a thousand dollars for that person's dinner? Would you take them out for dinner for a thousand dollars? And then you'll put that into perspective of you inviting them to the wedding. And then if you're getting pressure to invite someone that you don't really want there, or she's kind of out of obligation, that can also kind of put financial strain. Because even with our own wedding, actually, I think my fiance and I found that one of the biggest, bigger stressors was actually just figuring out the wedding list. Because it's a relatively small one, you know, like hundred people. Um, and then thinking about how am I going to like after, you know, 20 people with the right family between the both of us and then figuring out, you know, 40 each that can get very tough. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I mean, again, parents come into play there when you want to cut somebody <laughs> and they're like, no, you can't. And then yeah. you're arguing there with your parent. And you're like, but it's my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jay, I wanted to kind of come back to uh, the beginning of our conversation. You said you've been to six weddings in the past five years. How many of them were you a guest at and how many were you sort of part of the wedding party? So out of the six, I was part of the wedding party in five of those. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then the one that I wasn't in the wedding party, I did the hair and I part. I was a guest in the wedding. I make the joke that I'm the next 27 dresses, but I just love weddings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that if you didn't say it. <laughs> so, I mean, that has, uh, in part, as I understand it, kind of inspired the creation of a business that you have called Jay's Boutique. So tell us a little bit about that. I was actually supporting one of my dearest friends in her wedding journey um, through her Jack and Jill and her bridal party and bachelorette. So there was things even um, for the wedding day that I was doing for her. You know, I did her card box and things like that. And as I was kind of going through and making all of these things, you know, and just posting them on my social media, like, oh, made this today. People started asking me, like, do you sell this stuff? I was seeing how, I mean, obviously being my friend, I was I was doing things pro bono for her. But I seen how having that personal touch to a lot of things in life, like I feel like we're in the age of customization. So, yeah, it just I kind of took a jump. I wasn't really planning it. I mean, making more money is obviously always a good thing, but as anybody knows who's owned a business, making money does not happen quickly. It was the right time. It was in the fall when I really kind of launched things. And of course, Christmas just blew my business out of the water. And, you know, shout out to my friends because my friends really, really supported my journey through that. And I don't think my business would be where it is today without them. Yeah, it's nice to have something from the that big day that you can take away from it. And that kind of could possibly serve, you know, the rest of your life as opposed to just being an expense just for one big day. So, Dave, when you uh, launched Jay's Boutique, you said it was, uh, you know, you took a bit of a jump. You know, why did you feel the need from a practical standpoint to, to do that, to start a side hustle and cover some of these costs? So, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have a, a pretty decent day job. But at the end of the day, you know, rent goes up, food costs. I mean, we all seen what's happened in the last eight months or so. Like food costs have just gone through the roof. Unfortunately, in the corporate world, it's not like I can knock on my boss's door and say, hey, my grocery bill went up. Can I get some extra money? So I find a big part um, that our generation needs is some sort of side hustle. And I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're selling a product. Um, I know a lot of people have gone on journeys of um, teaching people about stocks and, you know, writing books for motivation or they're doing like life coaching things. And I think the reality of it now is we're in that generation of just like hustle, hustle, hustle. For me, I didn't have an RESP when I went to college. So I had to take out that loan and, you know, I had to learn about, you know, making that repayment um, back to OSAP after I was done. So, I mean, I also want to influence my daughter into the sense of, you know, multiple sources of income is becoming a reality. I know to start off with, a lot of it was friends, word of mouth, kind of a lot of uh, support from your inner circle. Um, what have you done to kind of grow the business beyond that a little bit? Um, what tactics have you used? Social media. Mm -hmm. Social media is going to have to be the way I go. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Instagram. You know, I've been a Facebook user from day one, but I really got to get on TikTok. Mm -hmm. TikTok seems to be the place to go now. Because you touched on the social media piece that I guess I just wanted to mention for that when it comes to the research part is also, I guess, not maybe not part of it's not letting the image of something kind of draw you in. Because all this, it seems like an obvious thing, but I feel like a lot of people don't. Um, it still can suck people in like the glamorized idea of like the hustle, entrepreneurship and so forth, and then not really seeing the reality of, you know, 
possibly making you know, $10 this month and then $500 the next, not being as stable, like understanding that that is something that's just part of the business. You kind of want to have the mentality of you got to think today of where you want to be in five years. You have to have the mentality like I'm a successful business owner. Just have that drive and the motivation. And every day is not easy. Like you said, some some months you pull in 10 bucks and other months you're doing great. And I've had those moments in my business. And it's hard not to get into that slump and think, you know, did I go wrong? But if you look at the statistics, year one is not successful for most small businesses. Okay. And they, that was also not uh, throwing shade at you, as the kids would say. I just, uh, a- example, but yeah, I know like it's, that's just the risk of a small business in general. Yeah, uh, no, uh, it's, yeah, it's so, the truth. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, uh, any final thoughts on how to kind of survive wedding season, you know, as guest or basically as the couple, member of the party? That's the thing. Go into this knowing that you you got to save a little bit. You have to have that phase where where you save. You do bank some money because you can budget down to the cent and you're still going to just blow. You're going to blow something. It always happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I believe uh, that's the main conversation, hopefully for guests and uh, also for people who might be getting married soon. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and good luck with the wedding festivities. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So that was a really interesting conversation. Um, I think yeah. I learned a lot there. What would you say are your key takeaways? I guess um, first thing is I did mention the issue of like familial pressure and so forth. That's not a dig at uh, either my family or my fiance. I just want to clear that up, <laughs> uh, clear the air. But I guess a, a piece of it too is a, that seems like a you know very universal thing. Like she related to that as well. You know, Jay did, and who knows maybe. In a few years or whenever you might come across that yourself it's it, it's something that might not seem like a financial matter but like if you say for example get familiar pressure and they kind of say that they want more people right like in our case it's pretty small venue like i mentioned 100 people but if there was more pressure to invite more people maybe we have to like get a bigger venue that seats you know 200 instead and then that can make a budget balloon and then maybe it could be a case where the parents are not covering it but they still expect that so that can be very tough there's this idea that the financial topic should be kind of taboo but i think that topic should not be taboo with those type of people and they should understand that yeah it's interesting like i've been in canada for five years now but a lot of my friends and family at home in the uk are reaching that kind of wedding season wedding age and so i've got some tough decisions to make because i can't i can't afford to fly back each and every single time right and i think you know while you always want to be there for your friends or your family going to a wedding one day is not worth breaking the budget for. It's not worth going into debt for, in my opinion. Right. And I and I truly believe that if you're as close to that person as as you believe you are, they can forgive you for that, or you can communicate and, you know, find a workaround and kind of help each other to get there. Right, on one hundred percent. I think like the as she had mentioned, the notice piece is a big part of it. Like you know, six months at least when you're sending out invites. I have had some people like, you know, more last minute. I've heard have instances of that with other people's weddings where kind of a last minute thing they kind of bail out, and that can always be annoying. But I think if then that might a part of that might be the kind of embarrassment or shame of just being able to say like, look, I this is kind of tough for me. So there might be kind of last minute changes and so forth that's come around. But I think you can avoid all of that. That sort of shame, guilt, the kind of running around with other excuses if you're able to, if you feel like you can just be open and honest about what the real problem is and if you know that early on. Yeah. And this goes back to what you said as well about, you know, familial familial pressure. That's right. a hard word to say. <laughs> I think you and your partner need to have a plan. You need to stick to it and be strong about it. And of course, there'll be pressures, there'll be things that you spend more money on than you think and things that you didn't even think of that you all of a sudden need to splash out five grand on. And that's really annoying. And when it comes to weddings, there are costs that you don't even think of, or the ones you assume are rolled into other services. So um, you don't want that to be kind of a kick in the teeth. Like if you're getting the venue, one small thing I've learned is that that does not include like even things like the plates, you're still paying for that separate after the venue. So <laughs> there's all the kind of different costs rolled on into each other. And once they get added on that you're not thinking of, and then like, oh, then you're paying for floral and then picking the napkins, all of that stuff is extra on top of what you're already paying. So mm-hmm. just a note, you know, food for thought. Yeah. One thing I will add to is that I really admire Jay's move to kind of turn that into a side hustle because we we all do things we all kind of attend things that our you know our friends are organizing you know maybe sometimes maybe it's just me but 
begrudgingly will go away if yeah. I don't want to. But yeah, I really admire what she's done and kind of turned her learnings. She's helping her friends and now turning that into a bit of cash flow. And, you know, that will help her to attend even more weddings. You never know. No, 100%. And then even for the, you know, for the couple uh, getting married, like that, that DIY touch, I find, is a big piece of it. Because you know, from an emotional standpoint, you want it to be a special day. Mm-hmm. And I think aside from just spending money, like if you can get stuff that's very kind of unique, custom DIY, kind of like handcrafted by people you care about, that adds something special to it too, even if it might be more time consuming. Because I know in my fiance's case, she's uh, her and her friends, like they'll get together and just like make uh, these, um you know, flower umbrellas mm-hmm. and like umbrella stalks oh, and then cute. wrap the flowers around. And that's just like a cool kind of custom thing. That also, you know, can save some money, but also just looks great. And it's something that adds like a little note of love. And I think just that, that personalization that makes it like that gesture that and like the logo, like the logo that foreigners are making an Indian, Indian flag combination that, like, you know, extends beyond that one big day. Mm-hmm. And it's something that's, you know, that's a true lifelong mm-hmm. uh, memory. Yeah. I don't think you need to necessarily compromise on the things that you truly care about. Right. You know, if you want to have the princess dress, absolutely go for it. No, exactly. But um, but yeah, there are ways to to manage that. I admire what Jay's done in terms of turning that into a, a business as well. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at hello at halfbank.com. Special thanks to executive producer Samantha Eamon and producers Kevin Hamilton, Shane Murphy, James Battiston, and technical producers Murray Alkaber and Mohammed Tabish. This episode was edited by Lead Podcasting. Until next time. <laughs>